Well, good morning. Morning, morning. Guys, we got, uh, we got live stream in the house, friends. And we got Metro as well. Can you say hi to Metro Campus? What's up? Make some noise for them. Glad you guys are here. Good to be here with you guys. Uh, there's a lot of cool things happening this fall, like you guys uh, saw. What if everyone? It's a great thing that we've been doing for over 10 years now, so love for you to be a part of that as well. Well, so this morning, uh, if you're a guest here, if you just walked into Metro or you just tuned in or you walked in here and someone invited you, this is a perfect uh, um, weekend because we're starting a brand new conversation, but it is, it is a tough conversation that we're starting. It is, uh, it's, it's a difficult conversation. It's hard conversations. Anybody love just hard conversations? Anybody? You just love hard? Co- no, no. How about, how about difficult conversations? Anybody difficult? Yes. Difficult people. Anybody? You love difficult people. Don't you want to just turn to some people and go, stop being difficult? Can I get an amen? Can we, right? How about we turn to each other and say, hey, stop being difficult. Let's just do that. Let's do that. Let's do that. Go for it. Go for it. Metro, go for it. Stop being difficult. Honey, stop being difficult. Throw that in there. Bro, stop. No, 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 no. No, talk about difficult things, though, because we are talking about that. I did a 5K uh, with the Metro crew. What's up? Yes, we did. The, yes, we did the South End Shuffle. It was a 5K. We talk about hard things. And then I realized something. The only way for me to make podium to, to win this thing is to lie about my age. I realized that if you lie about your age group, if you like register at like 90 to 95 year old, I'm winning this thing. I am. Or, or, or 10 to 15. I'm still winning this thing. So that's what I need to start doing. It was, it was hard, but it was, it was good. I'm glad that Trent at Metro organized that. That was wonderful. So let's talk about hard conversations. Uh, let's talk about um, when it comes to faith. Uh, this morning, though, I, you know, obviously I'm starting off light, but uh, man, I, I want to have a hard conversation because what do you do? What do you do? How do you believe when, when you look around and you go, God, what are you doing here? Like, have you ever had a moment like, I don't know how I'm supposed to believe uh, uh, because, uh, because of this? Like, how am I supposed to believe when uh, God allowed uh, this particular relationship to die? How, how am I supposed to believe in a God who allows this kind of misery? Like, how am I supposed to believe in a God or who is loving? that he allows such hateful things to happen. Like, how, how, how do you make sense of all of those things? So this series is just hard questions about how do you believe? Like, how do you believe even, even practical stuff? Like, how do you believe in Jesus when there's so many other options out there? Like, how do you believe and have faith and are hopeful when all the things in your life are going sideways? Like, how, how, do, you, how do you do that? So what I want to do is, is I want to just jump into it and we want to have a conversation Conversation, and I, I want to tell you something that uh, this conversation might not give you all the answers, but I think that to have conversations like this because they are necessary, um, they they do something else. They might not satisfy our 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 minds, but they will satisfy our souls. Like there is something about having conversations that are difficult, even because they're necessary, that does something to us. And so I'm hoping when we talk about how do you believe. Uh, when things go wrong or when you don't know what in the world God's doing, uh, how, how, do you, how do you really believe that? How do you, what do you, how do you process that? So we're going to jump in, and uh, what I want to do is I want to take you to a passage. Now, my first passage is actually in the Old Testament. Can you say Old Testament? Old Testament, Old Testament. So if you've got your Bibles, grab those. If you've got your phones or anything that allows you to pull up Scripture, it will also put it on the screens for you as well. And so here's what I want to do. I want to jump in and just talk about and introduce this guy named Habakkuk. Habakkuk was one of the prophets. And prophets in the, um, in the, in the scriptures were these people who were picked by God um, for a particular season and for a particular person, uh, um, people. And they would speak to people uh, and it was behalf of God. And so these people had major insight to what God was saying. And they predicted a lot of things. But they also had some really interesting conversations with God. So it wasn't just that their calling or their purpose in life. Their relationship with God was something that you and I need to really look into. Because it was very different from other people. And so what I want to read to you is, if you start off with this, this Habakkuk one, he starts off his book. So some of these prophets wrote books and letters, and this is how he starts off. This is, this is, this is how he starts off. He goes, how long? How long, O Lord, must I call for help? 
but you do not what? You do not listen. Violence is everywhere. I cry, I cry, but you do not come to save. Have you ever been there? You're like, I, I, don't, I don't know what you're doing here, but you're not coming. You're not coming closer here. And then he goes on, he says, must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I'm surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. And he's not talking about CNN and Fox News. But he's talking about all kinds of other things. But we can relate to this, right? We can relate to all kinds of things going around, around us and we don't know. And then he goes on and says, the law has become what? Paralyzed and there is what? No justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous so that justice can become, has become what? perverted. He's like, God, what's going on here? Now, have you noticed the tone you start off with? I mean, have you ever started your journal with that? God, you're not doing anything good here. Like, how long do I need to keep doing this? Now, if you're, if you're taking notes, I want to give you some certain things to kind of hold on to. The first point, if I was going to make some points, the, the first one would be is that you and I have permission. We have permission to feel. We have permission to feel all the emotions. When it comes to God, we have permission to just be real with Him. I think for so many of us, I don't think we're there. We, we, we don't quite understand this. But the prophets, he's like looking around. He's like, you know what, God? What are you doing? I don't get this. I don't understand this. Like, how long do I have to keep saying this? Like, why do you allow a bad things, terrible things to happen to good people. Why do you? I, I get the bad people suffering. I get that. But there's a suffering to suffering because sometimes it doesn't even make sense. Like the people who don't deserve it are suffering even more. There are people in the courts who don't deserve all kinds of sentences, but yet they're stuck in a system. Why are you allowing this? Why are you allowing devastation to take place? Have you ever thought that? Have you ever thought this this week? You looked at the hurricanes, you're like, are you kidding me right now? Like, why is this, why is this happening? And are you like me, like when you, there's so much injustice, there's so much suffering, you're like overwhelmed, you're like, I can't even, I can't even look at it. Have you ever thought that? Like, I just don't want it, I just, I just don't, uh, can I just scroll, I'll just keep scrolling. Like, I, I just, I can't, I don't have the capacity. And Habakkuk is being extremely real, but have you noticed what he's saying? He's like, God, you're not doing your job. Like, you are allowing this. And then did you notice what he said? He said, you've allowed more bad people in this world than good people. Now, I've, in my profession and, 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 and what, I, what I do, I've realized something, right? I have this interesting dynamic relationally with people. So when people meet me, uh, they, they, they act a little different. Now, depending on who they are. For example, there are pe if, if, if there are people who, have, who know of me, right? They, they, they know of me. They act a certain way. Like they, they know I'm a pastor, like at the gym, it happens. The grocery store it even happens at church. You know, they, or I go to Metro and they're like, oh, they know of me. And so there is a filter. There's a filter. There's a filter. When, as soon as they find out who I am, they know of me. They go, oh, he's a pastor. Okay. And then I hear a lot of, I'm so sorry. I, I, didn't, I didn't mean that. I'm, I'm going to hell for that. Like, 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 like things like that. They just, they just say a couple of things like, like uh, you know, I, I, forgive me. But recently, recently I was talking to a guy and there was stuff coming out of his mouth. And I was like, and I don't know why I was smiling. I shouldn't be smiling. But, but what I was smiling was because I was like, oh, wow. I remember the day you used to apologize for everything you used to say. Now you don't. Now you don't know of me. Now you know me. Like there is, there's a different kind of relationship when you know someone. Right? When you know someone, they can act like whatever. And so when I was having this conversation with this guy, I was like, oh man, how did we get so close? When did this happen? Like I was waiting for, I'm sorry. It didn't even happen. There was no sorry. There was no filter in his mouth. I was like, this is, uh, this is interesting. This is pretty interesting. You know, it's the same when it comes to God. People act the same way. When you, when you know of God, you, you, you have this idea of the, the kinds of things you can say and you can't say around him. Like that's why some of us were like, oh, I can, I can do such and such in the church, but I can't go in the church and do it, right? 
Or you've had thoughts like, not in the church. Like people say, you can't lie in the church. But you can lie outside. Yes. <laughs> yes. You can't lie in church. Oh, okay. Okay. You can't be mean in church. Okay. But outside, yes, you can be mean. Parking lot? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Parking lot doesn't count. Some of you guys know that. You're like, what the? Yeah. You guys know that. But, 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 but around, like, the presence or the, for example, uh, old school, like the, this would be called the sanctuary. <sighs> you can't do certain things. But when you get out of the sanctuary, you can just go wild, right? You can do whatever you want to. Let me ask you something. Have you ever cussed in prayer? Yes. Okay, thank you, sir. I got a yes here. Let me just tell you, Chris. I know him. If you haven't cussed in prayer, I don't know if you've really prayed. And you're like, are you serious? Don't walk out right now. I'll be done in 20. Um, I think for some of us, we think that God is emotionally unstable to handle all our emotions. Like he can't take it when we're angry because then he gets upset. He gets defensive. He gets insecure. He, he, he takes offense. He, 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 he's annoyed by us. We can't be totally real. We can't tell him everything we feel because he couldn't handle all our emotions. And yet what we find is that the people who had these powerful relationships with God would come to God and then God would make sure he, we write these things down, that they would be like beasts even before him. They would say all kinds of things. And here he's saying, God, you're not doing your job and you don't care. And friends, I don't want to take, make light of this, but if you haven't got to a point where you have allowed yourself the permission to feel all the feelings, and you're not really praying. You're not really being honest with God. Because sometimes we're so focused on being holy before Him, we forget to be honest. And so what God wants us to know in, when it comes to our suffering, He wants us to feel everything we're feeling. You have emotions. You have permission to feel all the emotions. The emotions of, I don't think you care anymore, and I think everything you said in the Bible is a lie. If you've never gotten to that point, friends, I don't know if you've ever gotten to put real with God. I don't know if you've ever got to a point where like, I can't stand you right now, and I can't believe this. See, if you don't get that real with him, and if you constantly think that God is so small that he's going to get so insecure and defensive, what you're thinking is he's like you. And he's like me. And he's like our loved ones and our parents that we can't really be honest to because we'll offend them. And he goes, I'm emotionally stable in this relationship. You're not. So guess what? You can't handle everything I can say, but I can handle everything you have to say to me. So for the love, just say it. And so Habakkuk starts off his book, guy. Like, let me just start with not, thank you, Jesus, for everything. No, no. He goes, for the love, how long do I need to do this? Because I'm tired, I'm sick and tired of this. And other prophets would say things like, uh, 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 my, my eyes are like, like fountains of tears. I am sick and tired of crying. I am done with you. Just kill me. I mean, things like that. So when it comes to our suffering, the number one thing you and I need to understand is God has given you permission to feel all the emotions. Have you given yourself permission to do that? He goes on, though. The passage, it says here in verse 5, the, this says, The Lord then replied. He says, Look, look around at the nations. Look and be amazed, for I am doing something in your day. Something. That's, that's really clarifying, isn't it? I'm doing something. That's wonderful. I love it. What is it? Well, well, he goes on. He says, you wouldn't believe it if even someone told you about it. That is just not helpful. I'm doing something, but I can't even explain it to you. I'm doing something. It's big. It's big. It's big. I'm doing something. 
But the point here is, here's the point. The second point is that God is listening to you. He, you have to know this. You have to know in the midst of your suffering, he is listening. Now, I know prayers sometimes feel like they're just bouncing off the, off the, off the ceiling, right? They're not really getting through. You feel like God's like ghosting you or you feel like, I don't even know, or like I'm praying, but I don't think he's listening to me. And I think for some of us, when, it, when we come to a point with our, our relationship with God, uh, we, 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 we have to decide or understand, hey, are, is, does God always listen to me or does God sometimes listen to me? Because when it comes to our human relationships, at times we just know or believe that people don't listen to us sometimes. Like, for example, if you're a parent, have you ever had your kids say, okay, uh, are you listening? Have you said to anybody else, even a coworker, are you listening to me? And they're like, yeah, yeah. You're like, you're not listening. Like, how many of you think, like, if you can be on the phone and listen at the same time? Right. I think I can. I can, I can listen. I can listen. But when it comes to my kids, though, here's what I do. Sometimes I do this. And you, have you ever done this? It's like when they're talking and they go, are you listening? I say things like this. Or I've said two kinds of things. Number one, I go, not now. Not now. Not now. Have you ever done that to a coworker? Not now. Not now. Maybe to another one, you're like, not today, Satan. Like, not, not, not you know, you don't say that out loud. You don't want to call them the devil. But you think that. Okay. So you're like, uh, not now, not, no, no, not now, not now, not now. I'm not, I can't handle it right now. So as a parent, I've done that, not now. Or I do this, not until you, not until you, not until you. You see where I'm going with this? Could it be possible that we do the same thing with God? We think that he's saying, not now. Do you know what's going on in the world? Am I really concerned about your job? Really? Not now. I'm busy. Or not until you get your act together. And that idea, the not until now, has been a philosophy that's crept into this, the, the message of Jesus, which I'm, I'm, I love the fact that we're reclaiming the message and movement of Jesus. And the number one thing we got to do is this idea that God will not listen to you at certain points in your life. Like we've, I don't know how we've believed this, but let me just tell you something. When you read the scriptures, when you read the stories, when you read the accounts, here's what we know about the character of God. He continually listens to you. Let me, let me, let me explain it this way. You could be dead wrong and he'll listen. You could be fully immersed in disobedience. He'll listen. You could be the abuser. What? No, you could be the abuser and he will listen. You, you could be evil, and he will listen. God will listen. There's no point where which he goes, I am so disgusted right now, I can't even look at you, I don't want to hear anything. I don't want to hear another apology of why you keep doing what you're doing. And I don't want you to repent about something, and you keep doing it. Have you ever, by the way, repented about something like said, I'm sorry, I'll never do it again. No, you're going to do it again. Anybody? Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Like lying, for example. Most of you are lying right now. <laughs> like you, you, we, we do this and we think God's like, oh, I'm not listening. Just understand this. I get it. The, your pain, your, uh, and I don't want to make light of this because for some of us, it's, 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 a, it's, 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 it's like a fog. It's like you're, you got hit and you're spinning and you don't know what side is up and you don't know what day and time it is. And for some of you, you're not here this morning. You're watching because the, the pain of walking into a crowd of people that are smiling is too much for you. And that's why you're watching. And I, I, I get that. But I need you to understand something. He is listening. He is listening. And he is, he is speaking to you. Now, with Habakkuk, he wanted, wanted him to do something very, something very particular, which I think is pretty practical for us as well. Here, here's what he says. He tells Habakkuk to get to a certain place. And so Habakkuk responds, and he says this. He says in chapter 2, he says, I will climb up. I will climb. I will climb up to my watchtower and stand at my guard post. Okay, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go up higher, he says. Um, there I will wait to see what the Lord says and how he will answer my complaint. 
Then the Lord said to me, write my, mess, my answer plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. This vision is for a future time. It describes the end and it will be fulfilled. It, if it seems slow in coming, wait patiently. For it will, what? It will, what? Surely take place. It will not be delayed. So what's going on over here? Well, in context, he is talking about, uh, God's talking to him about uh, the, the nation of Israel and what's going on in their time. But what is going on right there? Like, what, what can we learn from there? God says, I, I want you to do something. And it's as simple as this. Simple as this, if you're taking notes, is this idea of getting higher. Just getting higher. Now, I'm not saying get high, okay? Uh, because I need, I need this mosaic, I get it. Okay, don't get high, okay? I mean, we'd rather just get high than higher. Uh, we'd rather just, like, alleviate certain things, and we just, alleviate, we just want to medicate certain things. And he goes, I, wanna, I just wanna, I want you to get up higher. Now, why does, he, why does God want you to do that? And I think, I think there are several reasons. But it's not that we will get all the answers that we have that we need. Uh, we won't get all our questions uh, just dealt with. Sometimes I don't even know that, that, that God brings us close and when he begins speaking to us, he'll give us the answer. In fact, I'm not even quite sure because if you read the story of Habakkuk, I'm not quite sure there was a reason. He, God tells him what he's going to do, but he doesn't tell him why he's doing it. And for some, for something, for some reason for us, it is, we just need to be able to see so we can have a little bit of hope. Like how many of you, how many of you ever st get, got struck, it's stuck in traffic here in Charlotte? Anybody? Right? Okay. Is it, isn't it more painful when you can't see why we're all slowing down? Does it drive you mad or is it just me that we get to where we all slow down and I'm like, what, what happened here? <laughs> Nothing happened here? Ma! What are we doing? Why? Like, it's like one evil person goes, ha, 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 I'm going to have some fun today. I'm going to delay everybody. I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah, I can control time. Stop doing, whoever's doing that, stop it. But you know what's more, more frustrating? What's more frustrating is, is that when you're the only one stuck behind a semi-truck. And you're like, I just, I, just, I just want to see what's going on. I just, I just want to. Have you ever thought of it? I'm going to climb that thing. I'm going to, just, I'm going to stop the car, climb it. But I, I, what, 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 why, why we stop? Why, why? Have you ever turned to the side and kind of, kind of looked? Is it just me? Okay, maybe I have issues. I, got, I need counseling. I don't know what it is. I'm like, ah, oh, what, what, what is going on? Like, and I need, here's what I need. I need something terrible to happen there. To justify my waiting. Is it just me? Yep. No. It's all of y'all. Exactly. I, I did I just say y'all? Oh my. Don't clap. Don't clap. There's no clapping for that. Whew. No. But it, it's, it's true, isn't it? We just want to, we, we want, we want, we want, uh, the, we want to understand it. We need to, we need it to be justified. Okay, it's fine. I, I just need to see what the problem, I want, I want to justify it. And here's what I believe what God is saying to Habakkuk and what he did with Habakkuk, which I believe he wants to do with us, is this idea of just getting up a little higher. And you know this, and I know this, that we, if you get up a little higher, if you're just a little taller, you can see through, it, it does something to your soul. And for some of us, in a very practical, strange way, you have to get out of, sit out, stand up from wherever and whoever you're with, within the midst of the grief and pain, and somehow get just on higher ground. You just need to see a little bit further. And the reason is, is not because you get all the answers, but you'll, you'll, you'll begin to see something, something, not, not exactly why, but something that satisfies your soul. Because you know what Habakkuk and God are going back and forth? Habakkuk is like, do you not see? Do you not see what's going on? Do you not see? Do you not see why this is so terrible? Do you not see why you're doing this? Do you not see? And God's saying, I know what you see. I see more. I see more. I just see more. 
But why? But why? No, no, I get it, but I, I just see more. And if you read the scriptures, you find out sometimes that there is, there, 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 you can make a huge case where God sometimes does not want to give us the answer to our suffering. We make up stuff all day. All day for it. Sometimes to appease us, sometimes to, to, to help other people out, which is sometimes not even helpful. Like I remember the first time that I heard this, uh, and I, I've heard that expression before, but this time it just got a little too close. Like it was my, with my, um, my uh, brother-in-law passed away, and his daughter was there, and, and uh, um, there are people, you know, grieving and trying to console and things like that. And, and someone said to this little girl who was seven years old, oh, you know what, your dad's in heaven because God wanted an angel. So he, he took your dad. And I was like, shut the, stop it. Just stop this nonsense. And I know I get it. It appeases us somehow. We go, oh, there's a reason for everything. And I don't even know if that's true. Because at some point, you have to understand something when it comes to suffering. See, this is what God understands. God understands that if we can rationalize suffering, we can tolerate it. And if we tolerate suffering, there is no need to alleviate it. He knows that if we look at other people and we look at their suffering and we can rationalize and give an excuse or a reason to why they are suffering and why this is happening, if we can even do that, there is no need to help them out. And in the church, is done, it's the same thing. When the, when the church of Jesus, when people who are Jesus followers, who are called to be the most loving people and the most passionate people and the most compassionate people and to go out and we're here to, to serve the world. If we can rationalize someone, a particular group's suffering, we can tolerate it. Because we'll do it to, if, if you can just give me a reason, my mind feels good about it. And so then I don't need to alleviate it. If you can just give me a reason to why I'm broken and I can sit in that, I never need to go, move forward. And God says, I can't give you the reason for your suffering because you'll never want to eradicate it. So guess what? Even if I were told you, you're never going to get it. You don't need to get it. I think for us as a church, we need to understand suffering. Because as soon as we understand it, as soon as we rationalize it, we have an excuse for it. And we tolerate it. Well, those people, well, this person, well, she did. They kind of deserve that. And then we go down a path that God says, what are you doing? This is not the response to suffering. And by the way, I can remove suffering. God said, I can remove it. I can totally remove suffering. Now, I just, I just need you to change this human side of you. You're no longer going to be a human being. You're going to be a robotic being. Like I control everything you do. Because part of the problem is you. People. And so if I can just control them, which I, I, if you want me to do that, I'll, I'll remove suffering. But I will remove love and choice and freedom and life and relationship too. You will no longer be a natural human being. You will be something else. And so here's what I can do. I don't want to make you unnatural and I don't want to leave you natural. I'll make you supernatural. I'll give you more than you can understand. I can give you my Holy Spirit to live inside of you, to change you from the inside out. But I, 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 can't, I can't alleviate suffering. I can't give you an answer for that without taking away everything that our relationship and who you are. And so he says, I don't, I, you're not going to understand why. I just need you to get up higher get a higher perspective of why, of what sometimes things happen. I can't give you why. I can't give you why. And then lastly, he says this. I believe. He says, I want you, I want you to, to, hear, to hear him. Like to hear, to hear me. And what that means is, is that not just that God's listening and not only just that God give us permission to uh, feel all the feelings, and, um, but he, 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 he wants to, no, he wants you to know. I mean, I don't even know if I can fucking say this this way. I mean, because 
our pain and our grief is so unique that I think the only answer is that he just wants you to hear him. Like there are moments in life that God um, allows things to happen and it just, everything falls apart. And you feel, you find yourself on the other side of it, not really knowing who you are. Like you're not this person, but you're not that person either. Like you're not sad anymore, but you're not really happy. You're, you're not like, uh, sin, uh, you know, like uh, cynical, but you're not really full of faith either. You're in, you're in between. You're not really, um, you know, just going through life or coasting, but you're not really passionate. And sometimes things in our life allow us to do that. And, and then we try to find reasons because we're kind of stuck on this. I just want to know the reason why. And I just don't know if we're ever going to get that. But we're, we, are, uh, we have all the permission to feel everything that God wants us to feel and everything that you feel. And I want you to understand something. That in the midst of that, it is the one thing God wants you to do. He wants you to hear him. Hear him. Now, you, have, you might have heard this um, before. God wants you to trust him. And I get that. I'm a pastor. I should say that, right? I need, God, you need to believe in him. I get that. But let, just make it, let, me, let me just be real here. When we're going through so much suffering and we're going through this, 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 um, this mindless tragedy, you know what I'm talking about? Um, this, this, you could have fixed this. Have you ever had that moment? Like, I'm not going to say it, but you could have so fixed this. And that's why people struggle with God uh, and the existence of God. Like when people say, I don't, I don't really know if God exists. I don't, and they, they, they debate about this idea of like, is there a God that exists? If you ever noticed where the conversation always goes, um, well, if there's a God, then why does he allow X, Y, Z? You see, what, what's happening there is the human soul is not debating God's existence. The human soul is debating God's compassion. Because who cares if God exists if God doesn't care? That's why all our questions are really, I know he exists. I just don't know if he cares. Because if he did, this would not be happening to me. This would not be happening to him. This would not be happening to us. He would not let me go through this all by myself. Why has he left me so lonely? You see, most of us, we, we don't doubt his existence, man. We just doubt his heart. Hey, did you, do you even care? I mean, do you even care? Is it just because there are so many humans and you lose a couple of million and it's fine? Like, what, what is going on? And forget, not, forget that. I mean, all the things that are going on in this world and the, everything that's being, like, would you not even care? Like, that's the big question. So in the midst of that, I can't get up here and go, but here's what you need to do. You just need to trust him. No. And I don't even think that God expects that. I think God just wants you to hear him. So right now, you don't, you're not there yet. You don't trust him. It's fair. You don't believe him. Fair. You don't see him. Yes. You don't sense him. Yes. You, you don't know him. Yes. But can you hear him? Can you just listen? Can you just listen? So sometimes in the midst of our suffering, what people need to do is just be able to hear. You don't even have to believe it. You just have to hear because there's something about hearing things again and again because you and I have this internal committee, right? We have, a, we have voices in our heads that tell us why, how bad, what, what, what's wrong, what's wrong. And God says, I just want to be one of those. And hopefully I'll become the loudest one there. And you'll kick everybody else out. And so here's a passage that so profoundly illustrates this. He says this. This is Isaiah through another prophet. He's telling his people, he says this. He said, 
He says, yet Jerusalem, which is his people. So it's us. He says, and this is God talking. He says, he says that they say this, the Lord has deserted us and the Lord has forgotten us. He said, I know what you're saying. I know what you're feeling. You're feeling that you have been deserted and you've been forgotten. And then he says this, never. Can a mother forget her nursing child? Can she feel no love for the child she has born? And then he goes on, he says, but even if that were possible, even if that was possible, and for some of you, you're like, that's a bad example for me because my mom, my dad, I'm not, I don't even, and he goes, yeah, yeah, but even if that was, if that's possible, I will help me out with this. I will what? I would what? Not forget you. See, I have written your name on the palm of my hand. Now, man, there's so much symbolism here because when Jesus was died on the cross, he was nailed to the cross with his hands. And it seems like it feels like, okay, well, he was saying, I'm, 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 I'm writing your name on my hand because I'm nailing my hands to the cross because I've made a way for you to experience life to the full. I've made a way for you to go through the suffering. I've allowed God's spirit to live inside of you because of what I have done. And this idea of like writing someone's name on your hand is, is so, we're, we're all fascinated by this. But have you noticed that your hands tell a lot about what a person is up to and what they're in? Your hands reveal so much. And God's kind of like saying, hey, I, I've written your names on my hand because I just want you to know that if you, if you were ever to look up my hands, you would see the work that I've been doing for you. You would see it. And the first time I read this as I was preparing for this talk, I, I actually had this strange image because I was reminded by the story of the creation. And so the story of creation symbolically says that, that um, there's a, that the, 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 the Adam and Eve had this relationship with God and they sinned. And when they sinned, they were ashamed. All of a sudden, they were exposed by their sin and they began to hide themselves from God, but also from the, each other because they realized they were exposed and naked. And that was like the beginning of suffering. It was the beginning of this grief and pain and regret and, and shame. It started. And that was the first thing that happened. They begin to hide themselves. So God shows up in the garden and goes, where are you? And he goes, uh, we're, we're hiding. We're hiding from each other. We're hiding from you because we're naked. We're ashamed. And do you know the first thing he did? God made clothes for them. And he used what? Fur. It explicitly says fur. So th God was the first one to sacrifice and shed blood to cover for our shame. So when he says, I've inscribed you in the palm of my hands, he's like, my hands are bloody because of your sin. I've been working forever to cover you. I had to sacrifice creation for you. So, yeah, your mom can forget you and your dad can forget you and people can forget you and betray you and be married to you for so long and then leave and I can't forget you. So, I mean, I know you're going through stuff and I get it and I can't tell you. I can't tell you because you can't understand So I just need you to hear me. I'm not, I'm not not here. I'm not not here. I'm, I'm never leaving you. I don't care what you get into and what you go through. I'm not leaving you. So what does that mean to us? That means for us, we have to just hear him. You don't have to trust him today. Just hear him. 
You don't have to believe him. Just listen to him. Let me pray for you. Can we do that? Lord God, thank you for these conversations. God, this is uh, the first of many. And uh, I, I, I pray for your presence to be so real like it is in this moment, next couple of weeks. I know, I know people who are watching online or, or have just stopped and thought, I need, God, where are you? God, I know there are people at Metro right now that feel you so intensely. And they go, I know why I walked in here today. And there are moments like this, God, where you remind us that you're working because when we walk in and we hear something and you know that it's not from a speaker, it's not from a person, it is you just saying, hey, hey, I am listening and it's me talking. So God, I pray that we would hear you. And for some of us who are ready, we would trust you. And we would say simply this, Jesus, I give you my life. God, I thank you for that. I thank you for that. Amen.